How's everybody doing? My name is Christian Wagner, and I'm the Militant Thomist. So today, we will be getting back into the Pope St. Pius X series. It's been like three weeks since I've done one. Very sorry. Uh, somebody just reminded me that I should do one. And today is the day between. So, so imagine this. Yesterday, anniversary. Tomorrow's my birthday. So today is that, that middle day. And I got a new, a new light lamp. My lighting is terrible. It looks like I'm like, I don't know, in a basement or something. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to make this light. I don't know if this is good lighting or not. But whatever, you guys will have to suffer it. So before we begin, remember to join fluentgreeknt.com if you need the no Greek because you all need the no Greek. Become a patron at patreon.com slash militantomist. Buy my books. Link below the books that I sell, not the books that I write, because I reprint old manuals, which um, were very influenced by Leo the 13th, who we're going to talk about today. Well, a little bit today about how he died. Um, uh, rest in peace. Um, and that is all that I can remember. Subscribe and do all that fun stuff. So today we're going to talk about how Pope St. Pius X was elected to the papacy. And this is it. There's some interesting points in this story because um, somebody gets somebody gets mogged today. It's it's pretty bad. Uh, what happens? The the emperor of Austria decides to ruin somebody's chance of the papacy, and then Pope Saint Pius X gets elected. So, divine providence was working overtime uh, during this conclave. We're going to also go over a bit about how conclaves work and uh, fun stuff like that. So on July 20th, 1903, we're going back then, Pope Leo XIII, unfortunately, died. So what we have to understand uh, before we get into uh, the story about the conclave, about who Pope Leo XIII was. So Pope Leo XIII, he had ruled um, as Pope for 25 years, which is a very, very long time. Um, people like to talk about how Pope St. John Paul II uh, ruled for a long time, but um, Pope Leo XIII, he was, he was special. He went over time when it came to his, he was definitely a reforming Pope. He reformed um, absolutely everything, especially when it came to education, philosophy. He single-handedly um, brought back Thomism to its formal, former glory um, in the Leonine revival of Thomism. He was saintly. He was smart. Um, he went at the issues uh, when it came to the abuse of the poor by a lot of the, um, the, the super capitalists of his time. And he also um, wrecked the socialists too. So Pope Leo XIII, he was an absolute uh, tank. He was a rock. Everybody loved him. So he was, he was one of those figures who uh, was just one of the wonderful um, popes of, of all time to be, to be remembered forever for the work that he had done. But this meant when that, when he died, that there was a, uh, a huge, huge pair of um, red shoes to fill when he had died for the papacy. But before he had died, he actually uh, made a prophecy, and his prophecy would be that Cardinal Sarto, which is uh, Giuseppe Sarto, known as Pope Pius X, would be elected. So after he died, um, it was announced that the papal conclave would be held on July 31st. So there was a uh, sense in the air, at least around uh, the area in which Pope Pius X was, 
um, among his friends and family, among the people in Venice, because as we remember from last episode, that he was the cardinal, I mean, the patriarch of Venice, that he would be elected um, as Pope. So, oh, there she is. So before we get into that, um, recently uh, for my anniversary, I bought a soda stream. So unfortunately, I will not be able to tell you what flavor this is, but it is a flavor of sparkling water. It's mango. But let's get back into it. Where was I? Oh, yeah. So you had his you had his uh, the people in Venice. Now uh, you had his friends, you had his family. They were all joking like, haha, you're never going to come back. And uh, the people when when Sarto uh, uh, the pa uh, do you call him patriarch Sarto? Uh, his eminence, I guess would be him his eminence Sarto was leaving Venice, the people just flipped out because they they had a sense that he was never going to come back. And that ended up being true that he never came back to Venice after this point. And the reason he never came back to Venice, and uh, this is just some weird backstory, is that under Pope Pius the Ninth, there had been where um, the uh, would, would it be the Kingdom of Italy at that time? See, the Kingdom of Italy, the Republic of Italy, had taken Rome and basically gave what we know as now the uh, Vatican City to to the popes. And uh, Pope Pius the Ninth. Uh, he decided to protest against this because you can't just take the eternal city from from Holy Mother Church. So they became what were known as the prisoners of the Vatican. So this is the same thing which happened with Pope Pius X, that once you get elected to the papacy, you never leave the Vatican. So that happened with him too. So that's why he never returned to Venice, um, if you were wondering. So they flipped out. Uh, they were begging him not to leave. Uh, they were asking for a last blessing. They were they were just they were not happy that he was leaving because everybody kind of knew what was going on. And from this time forward, a bunch of weird things uh, began to happen, which foreshadows um, his election to the papacy. A, when he arrived in Rome, a Venetian lady uh, came to his lodging and then just straight up went and said, hey, you're going to become pope. Uh, please become pope. You'll be an excellent pope. And then also when he passed the Swiss guard, interestingly enough, the Swiss guard um, presented arms as if he was the sovereign pontiff. So uh, that is that is something which was very unusual uh, because, you know, they're they're just the Swiss guard. Uh, they don't they don't really know uh, who's who because Cardinal Sarto was not very uh, well known in Italy. So that was I mean, well known in Rome, that is. So that was a bit odd that this was going on. And on the other hand, there was so people people are people are being like that. There was this uh, French French cardinal who went up to uh, Cardinal Sarto, uh, our pious, and he and he asked um, if if Pius was a French archbishop, because again, people had no idea who he was. And, uh, and Pius responded uh, that he didn't know French. He responded in Latin because back then you could just talk to one another in Latin. And the French cardinal said, well, you don't know French. Uh, I guess you'll never be elected Pope. And then Pope Pius X was like, wow, whew, thank God I'll never be elected Pope. Um, that, that's really amazing uh, that I don't know French because I really don't want to be Pope. So the favorite for the conclave, uh, what had been going on at the time uh, that everybody thought was the cardinal secretary under Pope Pius XIII, you know, Pope Pius XIII, Pope Leo XIII, I wish there was a Pope Pius XIII, but Pope Leo XIII, uh, Cardinal uh, Marino Rampola. So Cardinal Maria Rampola was, was the guy that everybody thought was going to be Pope. Well, he's going to become very important um, soon, but the, the papal conclave was about to start. And I will kind of get into how the uh, papal conclave works. So when the pope dies, the cardinal um, Camerlengo, uh, he becomes the representative of the Sacred College of Cardinals. And he takes charge of the papal household. And he goes and notifies all of the cardinals of the entire world that the pope has died and that there will be an election. He gives a date and everything. So every cardinal has the right to vote in the conclave, at least back then. Now those rules have changed for no nefarious reasons. Um, but he must be present in person to vote at the conclave. You can't just uh, send in your vote from afar. That's not how it works. 
So every cardinal can take with him a secretary, uh, who is usually one of his trusted priests, and he can take along with him a servant. So uh, at this, during this time, a large portion of the Vatican Palace is walled off. It is, they are bricked in and they uh, divide, um, they divide the Vatic part of the Vatican Palace into apartments, or they're also called cells for the cardinals uh, while they are staying there. And access to these cells are only through one door. So it is, it is extremely um, intense the way in which they are cut off from the rest of the world. And this one door is left open until the con... Oh, wait, no, access, not, not to the cells, sorry. Access to the whole, like, part of the Vatican Palace is only through one door. And this is left open, and then once the conclave begins and everybody goes in, uh, the door is closed and it is not opened um, except by the marshal of the conclave, um, or who is who is outside and the um, Cardinal Camerlengo who is inside and basically unless somebody dies it is not getting opened up so all communication with the outside world is ended until an election happens so the conclave opens 10 days after the Pope's the former Pope's death um, or at during the evening and then on the following morning, uh, the Cardinals hear Mass uh, in the Pauline Chapel and receive the Holy Eucharist from the Cardinal Dean, who solemnly adjures, the, adjures them to elect a Pope. So soon after uh, that Mass happens, they assemble in the Sistine Chapel, and then the voting takes place in the Sistine Chapel. And... Um, Oh, yeah. So each of them gets a small slip of paper and they write the name of a candidate and they all put it um, in a chalice on the altar and they take the oath, quote, I call to witness the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be my judge that I am electing the one whom before God I think ought to be elected. So then the ballots are counted. The ballots are read aloud. And if no candidate receives the necessary two thirds majority, they are burnt in a little stove and um, the chimney extends through the window of the chapel and the color of the smoke can be seen by those outside. It is not until the election is made that the ballots are burnt without the accompanying straw. So that is, uh, you, you have, everybody knows about the white versus the black smoke. That's why the color of the smoke is different because some of them are burnt with wet straw and other ones are burnt without wet straw. So just burnt alone. So that's why the color is different. So voting is going to take place twice a day, morning and evening until they finally get a Pope. So this is, so now that we've, we've got that out of the way, I'm going to take a drink of water and check to see if there's any comments. Oh, thank you. The Pope of swag. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I've read that uh, that many have said that his conclave was corrupted by the Austro-Hungarian powers. We're, we're just about to get into that. It's, this is when it gets interesting. So, the Austro-Hungarian powers. So, you remember how I said that Cardinal uh, Rampola was the favorite? Well, during the first round of voting, Cardinal Rampola got the most votes, although he didn't get the required two-thirds majority. And during the middle of the voting, we have to understand is there is this ancient right of veto that some Catholic monarchs like to claim for themselves. And the Austro-Hungarian government, um, well, the emperor, decided to, um, to exercise this right and send the veto for Cardinal Rampola. It's not clear why they did it, but they did send the veto for him. And now everybody in the conclave, uh, once once this note had been passed to them that their, this veto had been wrought, flipped out. Everybody freaked out. It was because it had not been exercised in centuries. It, and it had never been successfully exercised, actually. So this like this is the the 20th century we have to remember, and there are governments who are trying to, to claim that right, and this is a very secular government with the Austro-Hungarian government, who is trying to do this. But everybody freaks out, and there is this veto, and he had been the favorite; he had gotten the most votes, 
But after this point, it basically ruined the chances of Cardinal Rampola uh, winning. So um, that that's that's the the brief note. But on uh, on the thirty first of July, the Cardinals there were sixty four of them assembled in the Vatican. And at nightfall, the door was closed that we talked about, and it was bricked up. And uh, during the first vote, uh, Cardinal Rampola got 24 votes, Cardinal Gatti got seven, and our Cardinal Sarto only got five votes. So he was not looking like the favorite to begin with, not at all. So um, Rampola had to get, I think, he had to get, actually, I think it's a simple majority now that I'm, now that I'm thinking of it. Um, he had to get 32 votes and he got 24. So he was, he was very close. Um, but, but Sarto, he was not even in the running. He only got five votes. So Cardinal Sarto, um, he, he took a breath because he saw that there was almost no chance for him to be elected until the, until the note from the Austro-Hungarian government came in. And at the second vote, um, the he got 10 votes and then he started to freak out and then at the third vote he got 20 votes and this is where he began to uh he began to have some obvious distress and it's funny because the other cardinals reported that what happened at this point um at the third vote when he got 20 votes is that pope pius uh, went around to the other cardinals and he begged them to stop voting for him he he was he was like weeping and like got on his knees and were begging the Cardinals who were voting for him to just stop and vote for somebody else. And then uh, Cardinal Gibbons, who's, who's famous from, um, he was an American Cardinal. He said, quote, it was, um, it was that very adjuration, his grief, his profound humility and wisdom that made us think of him all the more. We, uh, we learned to know him from his words as we could never have known him by hearsay. So at this point, when people saw him going around begging for people to stop voting for him, what that did is it caused more people to want to vote for him. So at this point, Pius, uh, he, he needed he needed to just take a breather um, after the, the nightly vote. And he went and prayed before the Blessed Sacrament for a few hours. And he came back to his cell and there were a um, there were several cardinals waiting for him at his cell. And no, they weren't there to like beat him up or anything. They were there to beg him not to refuse uh, the papacy, because at that point it became quite clear that he was going to be elected to the papacy because he uh, ever, everybody at that point uh, kind of fell in love with uh, with with Cardinal Sarto after they saw his his profound humility and um, his absolute um rejection of any idea of him being elected to the papacy so on the fourth day of voting uh he received the proper amount of votes and he was elected and took the name pious and then was clothed with the papal vestments so at this point uh his family and everybody um in his hometown and everybody throughout the world were um, informed that pious was elected and then rather than go around and do all the, the fun stuff, shaking hands and smoking cigars, Pius decided to go back to his cell and he prayed before the crucifix for several hours, just hours upon hours, until his servant uh, convinced him to, to uh, get some food that he needed to actually eat. But rather than getting food, what Pius did is he rose up and he went to Cardinal Herrera, um, Cardinal Herrera, and he was the Bishop of Valencia, and he was 80 years old, uh, and at this point, uh, while he was in the papal conclave, he was extremely sick, uh, and he was lying in his cell. Again, this is, it, it was very serious. You had, you had a sick man on his deathbed, and he still went to the papal conclave. So he had been sick for quite a few days, and he had actually already received his uh, final sacraments, and was basically at the point of death. But Pius entered the cell and he gave him the papal blessing, uh, at which point the Cardinal Herrera uh, rose up and just was completely healed from his disease. So this was the first miracle that uh, Pius had performed and that we know of, because, again, um, a lot of those we he he's a saint, so he wouldn't just go around telling everybody about all the miracles he performed. But Cardinal Herrera was completely healed by Pius's papal blessing.
So at this point, um, Pius was elected, and uh, as we said before, he was not well known outside of Italy. So you had people wondering what kind of pope uh, Pius would be, whether he'd be conservative or liberal, whether he'd focus on studies like his like uh, his predecessor Leo the Thirteenth, or whether he'd focus on uh, uh, I don't know, uh, sacred music, which was actually one of his focuses, or the Eucharist. Who who knew? Who knew? So two months after his ascension to the papacy, he released his first encyclical where he kind of set forward how things would be going on during his during his reign. And in it, he wrote uh, echoing St. Anselm, it matters not to tell what with what tears and with what earnest prayers we have sought to thrust from us this appalling burden of the pontifical office. So as we said before, uh, Pope Pius X was not happy that he had been elected to the papacy. He saw it as an appalling burden. So this first encyclical was on the restoration of all things in Christ. Uh, this is an absolute masterpiece. Uh, everybody should should be out there reading uh, this this encyclical. It is it is truly um, a wonderful wonderful um, one one of the greats uh, with the with papal encyclicals. So and when you read this, um, interestingly enough, you get comments during the time of the people who are reading it. And people were like, wow, what, what a wonderful encyclical. Um, this is so great. Um, you are really uh, showing your pastoral heart here and everything. And while, while, that's, while that's true, I think at least from reading the, reading the encyclical myself and in view of the last hundred and about 119 years, since the encyclical was was uh, originally written, what you get is you get Pius, who is like an apocalyptic prophet. He was he was getting some sort of you you see throughout his papacy he was getting some sort of visions of the future or or something, because he he absolutely flips out on uh, on evil in the world, and the and guarding the church from being corrupted uh, from the world and everything like that. You 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 get some sort of like. Uh, apocalyptic prophet um, as as Pope, and this this really comes through uh, through this encyclical. Uh, he's he's like sending and this. We'll get into this later, but he's like basically having a Gestapo um, of trying to spy on uh, on the modernists to root them out, and uh, and writing encyclical after encyclical and letter after letter. He he's going hard against the modernists, and I feel like. Uh, he definitely had some sort of insight into the future about some of the corruption which would which would take place. So in this encyclical, he wrote to to uh, to show the the apocalyptic um, aspect of his first encyclical. Quote: When all this is considered, there is a good reason to fear lest this great perversity may be, as it were, a foretaste, and perhaps the beginning of those evils which are reserved for the last days. And there may be already in the world the, quote, son of perdition, end quote, of whom the apostle speaks. Such, in truth, is the audacity and the wrath employed everywhere in persecuting religion, in combating the dogmas of faith, in brazen effort to uproot and destroy all relations between man and the divinity. And then he goes on to write, uh, quote, Verily, no one of sound mind can doubt the issue of this contest between man and the Most High. Man abusing his liberty can violate the right and the majesty of the creator of the universe. But the victory will ever be with God. Nay, defeat is at hand at the moment when man, under the delusion of his triumph, rises up with most audacity. So even though we can rightly recognize uh, what Pius saw, in his in his sort of apocalyptic uh, mindset, I think what we also have to recognize is what he says there, that the victory will ever be with God, that even even with the current crisis, uh, which everybody can admit that there is in the church, um, we we can always recognize that this is merely a period of purification. And that even with, even through all of the the pain and the corruption which may happen, which has happened many times in the history of the church, that the victory is always with God and that he will always triumph over any evils which may corrupt his church. 
So to, to end things, um, as he had many, 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 many times before, as we have went over, his first action as new pope, well, at least one of his first actions as new pope, was to distribute 4,000 pounds among the poor of Rome and 2,000 pounds among the poor of Venice, because Pius um, always had a heart uh, for the poor. So that is all I have. I will check the, the um, live chat. It's your birthday. No, actually, my birthday is tomorrow. But today, I, I will be having a very brief stream because I got sent a birthday present. Um, it was it was addressed to Dumox Kruger. So I, I was I was addressed a birthday present. So I will be having a short stream tomorrow opening up my birthday present. But uh, today is the day before my birthday. It's still another what, five and a half hours till my birthday. These are really great. Keep making them. Thank you. Thank you. I like this. This is kind of like a, a, a quote, guilty pleasure. It's not really guilty, but it, a guilty pleasure of mine is to um, is to do historical stuff like this. I love I love going over the lives of saints. It's really fun. Happy birthday, my brother. Thank you. Celebrating the birth and original sin. Happy day of nativity. What's going on? Oh, it's uh, it's my birthday tomorrow. Oh, it's half, it's past midnight for you, so it is my birthday where you are. It's my birthday tomorrow. I'm just going over the life of uh of Pope Pius X right now, Corey. That's that's all that's going on. But tomorrow I will be having a and how do you guys like the light? I mean, I, I kind of hate this lighting. I mean, nah, it mm, I, I just don't like it. Happy birthday. Thank you. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. I will see you tomorrow, and I'll be in VC tonight. So if you guys join the Discord at about 10, 15, 10, 30 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go into the VC to chat with people. So if you are interested in that, then join the Discord. The link is below. But thank you, everybody, and a special thanks to the Pope of Swag for sending me $10 for my birthday. I much appreciate it. So I will see you all later. Goodbye. And remember, our Lord has ascended on high. Alleluia. Alleluia.